Good afternoon and welcome to the Computational Science Colloquium Series. Today I have the privilege to introduce Miguel Dumé. I have, I think we have met for at least 20 years. And over all this year, we have talked about collaboration and different things. And he, I remember he worked at Lawrence Livermore for a while, JTL. Uh, USC and uh, oil company or in Brazil. And the last one was uh, MathWorks. And finally he landed here at the CSFC and now he's a research, uh, uh, research uh, professor. And we have been now collaborating in Method Methods, which is something that I've been involved for 30 years. And one of the most, uh, let's say, uh, pressing question that I have over the year that I think, and I never had the chance to discuss with this anybody, is what are the mathematical foundations, basically? I will phrase it this way about the method. So we started talking about this and it made, uh, I, I believe, substantial progress in quite a few things that uh, Miguel will tell us about. Thank you, Jose. Um, so I, I began to work at Diego State for my hours last year. And so I, you know, I never had a really uh, full um, understanding of these mimetic methods. And so part of my work, because I wanted to collaborate with Jose, was to be, become more familiar with this. Um, in the meantime, I realized that there are several uh, methods that were at least two of them that were developed here at the university. Um, and so I will talk about them. And then in the end, um, there were several things showing up, um, in particular, uh, a project that uh, we're trying to develop with Mark, which is the back of the room. And, and, um, and so this ended up, uh, even though it's not related to what I will explain today, um, it, this presentation, I tried to keep it simple. However, it has a lot of pieces uh, in it. And so what I plan to do today is uh, just to show the energy conservation and numerical stability of these mimetic finite difference schemes in general. So the proof, is done in such a way that even though we have several numeric methods, the proof applied to all of them. Okay. Um, so I will talk um, about a little bit of, of properties that we would like the method to have. Uh, so I will talk about a little bit, just very rapidly about some vector calculus and integral theorems properties that we wish the method to have, then the constant order accuracy, including up to the boundary, is another nice property that the method has. So uh, you can actually have high order accuracy, constant over the whole domain, even on the boundary and nearby. And in addition, it, it is based on finite differences. So it's, it's relatively simple to understand, it's very simple to implement, and also if you go to high dimensions, is very simple to construct. And if you try to, to work in linear domains, which is uh, a project with Mark, um, it's actually we developed uh, there was already uh, something in the in the in the previous um, version of the of the code, but we try to apply it and, and extend it to to a general linear. Um, domains. So we will talk about the Greek and the operators, the methods, the stability, and some, um, some property related to um, the integration by parts. And then I will introduce this uh, decretization scheme. This is a high order decretization scheme in time. Um, it actually can work on staggered domains. And um, it gave me a headache because uh, 
we didn't, uh, there is not much information in the paper. And however, I guess that I, I found a mistake in one of my codes and I tried to fix it. And I realized that the way to do it was through um, deriving the whole thing. And I, I, I was able to do it. And then we, I, we chose numerical experiments. At the end, I will talk about this and then you some property. So, again, we would like that the, the mimetic methods um, will hold discrete analogs of all a vector calculus identities. Some of them are here, and also some integral uh, formulas, like this one, um, which is a generalized or some, some version of an extended uh, divergence theorem. Also, we would like to attain constant high order accuracy over the whole grid, including the boundary. This is achieved like usually for any different method via Taylor expansions. And there is a special treatment near the boundary to avoid ghost cells. So I, this is all what I will say about the high order. This is not um, related to this, but I will focus on how we try to mimic this problem. May I say something? Okay. I wouldn't say that it is based on finite differences. Okay? Yes. Okay. Why? Because when I construct the operators, I don't use finite difference at all. Now, it coincides with finite difference in the interior for a uniform mesh. That's true. But it's not that I start with finite difference and I went, what do I need in order to make it? Yes. Okay, no, yes. 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 And the other one is that I don't use Taylor expansion. The point is Either. the way I derive the method because I need to understand what was via differences. And I did that. So uh, hopefully, you know, we match. That's, that's the way I approach it. Okay. So the computational grid domain. Let's suppose we have a d dimension, d dimensional grid. And let's suppose it's Cartesian and it's a product of intervals a, i, b, i. So a1, b1. Uh, cross product with a two b two and so on, given measures. And so um, let's assume that we will split each of the dimensions um, just for simplicity with uh, a constant mesh, constant size interval. So there will be m i number of cells along the x i axis, and and so here is the point we are assuming something like this okay. and so the the mimetic methods uh that are currently established they work on um staggered grids so they have some information on the nodes or faces of the elements and there is some information on the centers usually you have scalar fields on the centers and vector fields on the nodes or faces. And so there are several sets that I need to define. Xi is the collection of all the nodes and centers. So it's the collection of all of them in each, in each of the in each of the dimensions. Then the nodes, there is another set that refers to the nodes. There is another set that refers to the centers, only the centers. And there is another set that will refer to the centers um, union, the vertices. Okay. And so I will introduce this X, which is the Cartesian product of all of them, and S, which is the Cartesian product of all the centers and boundaries. And N, which is the collection of nodes and center. I will explain this in a, in a picture. Actually, a picture will help us to understand this better. But um, it's just to show. And so this is a picture. I hope it will clarify what it is. So um, scalar fields uh, are is F. And scalar fields are defined, are defined at the centers, you see. We have centers on the S around the centers, but also they are at the centers of the boundary. Okay. And also on the 
on the corner. If, if, if you are trying to forget for a minute that this is a two-dimensional picture, I just focus on one dimension, you'll see the color field is given at the sentence and also on the boundaries. Vector fields, information, even on the faces. And suppose you have, when you have a vector field, you have in two dimensions, you have two components, horizontal component, a vertical component, and you have the horizontal component for vector fields are with letter B. And so they are defined on these places. And, and the vertical ones are defined also on these places. So it's, it is a little bit elaborated. This is a staggered grid. As I said, there are certain quantities, color fields on the center, basically, and vector fields on the faces. Okay. So the problem is if I if I want to, you will see the drum that since I have quantities in two different phases, for instance, if I have a, a, a scalar field and I want to complete the gradient of the scalar field. The, the result of the grade of the scalar field is a vector field. And so, even though the original quantity is on the centers, the result will be on these points. So, you are computing the, the, the gradient on, on these points using information on the centers. Um, and so, if you try to compute something more complicated, like a second mixed derivative, then you will have to, um, and, and so for instance, you would like to compute something that says, um, um, let's say you have a scalar field and you compute the gradient and the gradient will give you information on the faces, but then I want to apply the divergence just to construct um, um, not the divergence, but another, let's say, Another quantity that is on scale of two, and then I, need, I need to interpolate moving because I have information on the centers, I have information on the faces, I have to move information from the faces to the centers to be able to compute again uh, with to make a product with another scalar field. So I need interpolations, and that is one of the issues that I, I have to deal with. And since mimetic, as I said, uh, mimetic um, operators are able to have high order, I, I need to have high order interpolators also. Um, in the void. But interpolating all the time is, is a, it's a problem. And so let's actually uh, introduce notation. So this is the gradient, the usual uh, divergence operator, and it is, um, in mimetic is uh, represented by D. The gradient is by G, the curve, Operated by C, the Laplacian, and we have at some point we will need to um, guarantee high order uh, accuracy for the approximation or for the discrete analog of the um, Gauss divergence theorem. And so, for doing that, we will need to introduce a couple of weight uh, matrices Q and P, and <coughs> the ID and G are interpolators that um, just to facilitate passing from faces to centers and the other way around. Okay. And so, mimetic methods, uh, there are mimetic methods of second, fourth, six, and eight order. Uh, there are two collections of them, staggered and full staggered. And Casillo Grand developed in 2003 is an example. Corino Casillo is another example. The information the scalar fields are on the centers and the vector fields are on the faces. And then the operator G goes from the centers of boundary to the faces. And the diversion goes from the faces to the centers and boundaries. And there is a need for high order operators. And a full stagger is something that is um, uh, um, work that is going on. And so we are extending the grid divergence for the full grid. That way we don't need interpolations. So we'll have the information for everyone. Um, and so 
the pneumatic operators in n dimensions and greater or equal than two. Operators, all the operators mentioned there in high dimensions are built by a chronicle class of 1D operators with certain combinant matrices, most of them identical, or slight variations for identities. Uh, the properties in high dimensions will follow from the properties in 1D. The PDEs and curvilinear domains are approached by a uh, um, Jacobian and inverse Jacobian. And the high dimensional equivalent to the integration by part is the observations, these are the observations. And we will convert this integral as an inner product on the analog version using certain uh, weights just to guarantee the identity and to guarantee also the high accuracy, high order accuracy. Um, here we have an, an, um, a continuous scalar field. F is the discrete version of it. V is a continuous okay. vector field, and the capital V is the discrete uh, analog of it. Um, and so, properties that we will need for, for the conservation. The, you know, when you have one, consider the um, scalar um vector scalar field one if you apply the gradient it should give you zero and so since we approximate this operator by matrices assume that you have one discretized you have a column of only ones and multiply by a matrix and you have zeros a, a vector of zero that means that the rows of g should be zero the sum of the rows the row sums and the same happens to the divergence and so you would have, these are the properties that we need to have, and uh, we have them for uh, proving the, um, the energy conservation. Um, about the stability of the 1D operators. So, as I said, um, the, for instance, let's focus on the divergence because it's the one that we will use in the, in the proof. Uh, the divergence goes from um, nodes, there are five nodes, two centers, and there are four centers. Okay. And so it's a non square matrix. I cannot talk about the eigenvalues of this matrix. So for doing that, we um, actually, if we are talking with the divergence, um, we also see an interpolation that will return information. And so this interpolation, since interpolation goes um, from the um, particular case, I want to uh, have to finish it. So, the information is at the centers. Okay, suppose I have an scalar field and I have the information at the centers. However, this applies from the boundary to the centers, so I need to move this information to the boundaries and I need to apply an interpolation. Okay. And that interpolation will go from four dimensions to five. And then I could apply D, which actually returns to four. So this is a square matrix, and I can actually consider the eigenvalues of this. If I compute the eigenvalues of this, I have in this axis, so I have the picture for second order, fourth order, sixth order, and eighth order. <clears throat> and here are the number of interior cells. So the number of cells that I divide uh, this as um, we are talking of 1D operators, and this is the maximum and absolute value uh, of the eigenvalue real part. And so you see that these quantities for 1D are in the order of 10 to the minus nine, all of the eigenvalues. Even though you increase up to 1,000 um, interior cells. On the other hand, these are on the fourth order are 10 to the minus eight. So the eigenvalues are very small. When I go to six, we are to the maximum real part of the eigenvalue is 0.09. And when we go to um, 8, is 0.28, even though you can increase this. And so you can 
and you see it is stable. You see, the, it's essentially stable. And you see this picture also as a line if, if, if this is, you know, the, the scale is 10 to minus 9, 10 to minus 8. This is essentially constant. Doesn't matter how much you increase the number of elements uh, in the grid. Okay, I want to um, talk about the stability of Corvino operators, the numerical stability. And so in 1D, we have seen that the real part of the eigenvalues of this product for order k is less than one. And in 2D, we then cells in the x-axis and n cells in the y-axis. The operator is written this way and is given by this form. It has one piece and this other piece. Sorry, the operator D is this piece and I is this Kronecker product. When I multiply these two, I get this. And since uh, the eigenvalues of our Kronecker product is the product of the eigenvalues, I could actually see that this is an identity with zeros. So the eigenvalues are zeros or one in this particular case, and the same pattern here. And so this already has a property in 1D <coughs> that being less than one, less than one. So I will have that the, all the eigenvalues are less than one. Yes. Could you say what do you mean by stability? Um, in this particular case, I am trying to analyze the the, the growth of the, sol of the numerical solution. Which numerical solution? Of just focusing on the operator, how this operator will grow. So I have just the pieces. I am not talking about a particular numerical scheme for a particular uh, differential equation. And so this shows that we have this for any of the orders. Um, again, a similar process is applicable for the, the dimensional gradient operator. So I have this. Um, and so now I suppose to talk about the energy conservation, but since that um, is more, is a more theoretical stuff, let, let me just jump on and show you the numerical results and talk about the high order time staggered discretization scheme. Uh, this is, as I said, this is, um, I found this information in this paper, and it proposed actually two kind of leapfrog schemes that are of third order and fifth order. And um, now um, I, I realize how they build these operators and I can actually create one of seven and nine. Um, and these methods combined with the abnormality uh, decision by its second order is consistent and also stable. Uh, and <clears throat> so we have converted. But again, this is the potential. I am I not working with a particular equation. So the method is as this. Suppose we are talking about this idea. The thing that actually um, kept my attention caught my attention from, from this method is, is for this system. So for any PD, I could actually use any different method, any kind of different method, and discretize space, and, or we could actually work with mimetics, creating the mimetic analogs. And so it's focused just on time. And so F is a function that goes from are n to n for some n positive. And so the algorithm is essentially this. It is, you approximate the derivative by phi n plus one and phi, um, um, c n plus one and c bar n minus one. And the quantities are in, in c n. And so rest to know what is this. And so this is, given by this expression. And this depends on n minus four, n minus three, n minus two, n minus one, and an n plus one. So n plus one is over here. This n minus one is here. So it is an implicit scheme. Okay? And depends on several stages. However, that is kind of complicated to implement and there is a, a better way to do this. Um, if I, and, and this, um, 
implementation, as you observe, depends on a parameter, gamma six, because uh, this is, uh, it depends on six, in six stages, and it's five order. And the way you uh, implement this is just, let's create this uh, artificial function based on the other one, and the algorithm works like this. So given, um, given P bar n minus three, P bar n minus two, C, C tilde n minus one, C tilde n, using the algorithm, I can compute C tilde n minus two, C tilde n minus one, uh, C, sorry, P bar n minus two, P bar n minus one. So I can do one step forward. And, and so remember, we have the, the actual variable is C. This is an artificial variable. And this is a second artificial variable to make this scheme to work. And it actually, it's very simple to, simple to implement. Very simple, it's four lines. Um, and also, there is, in that paper, there is a study about the amplitude factor and also the error phase. And the amplitude factor, you see, is never uh, more than one. So it has some potential. And so we apply this method for this particular problem, a convection problem, and the initial condition, so it's between negative three and eight kilometers, the initial condition is given by this function. Uh, there are two parameters here, O, D, and L, they are here. And periodic boundary conditions, delta x is 100 meters, delta t is two seconds, gamma six is 0 0.1, 0 0.0, so be a number between zero and one. Mm. And just to get some initial data, I apply a half a step forward order that way the information is staggered. And then I apply three log B prop schemes to get just an initial data to start. Okay, so here I have the evolution of the algorithm. The initial data is this one. After 400 seconds, um, um, really 200 steps because the second the time step is two seconds. This actually is moving that way. And after 400 steps, 600 and 800. And you see that actually is um, moving um, in that direction. And I have two solutions printed. The, the one at the step 200 and the previous one, just to see how it moves. And you see, um, so this is uh, interesting and we the move my flight forward. Okay, so now let's talk about the um, energy conservation. So for the energy cons conservation, I will consider this uh, problem. Um, So let's assume that we have um, a system of C conservation law, and it's in n dimensions. And the problem of dealing with this equation in general is that there is no mathematical theory for it in general. So normally, uh, what people will do is consider these one-dimensional cases for theory, or the other alternative, if if you actually have uh, terms of this form, a one uh, u x a two u y plus then equal to zero, and this is the case I will adopt. And so let's assume that u is defined in negative one one. So this uh, the problem is. Let's put it in, in just 2D or in 1D just to make it simple. And I have X, negative one, one, and this is T. And so the problem is um, consider a system of sequence original laws, three dimensions, where these are uh, symmetric matrices. And we have um, these equations in the dimensions, the one that I wrote there, X is in negative one and one and t is greater than zero. And then 
we have an initial condition, okay, W naught. And also we have some boundary condition and the boundary condition is actually given on this negative one side. So the boundary condition is, is over here. Okay, so we have G in, in this boundary condition. And this, this has no boundary condition. The initial condition is uh, W naught, I think. It's over here. Okay. So there is some flux going in. Need to have some conditions on the coefficient matrices that, in order for that to be well posed. The, the, the matrices have to be positive, not yes. only symmetric, but they have to have all real, all positive eigenvalues. Yes, okay. I, 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 I said symmetric, and, and actually, um, I have this. I, I didn't write the, the full condition here, but this is talking about these matrices and how do you actually construct. This uh, complex uh, operator and the eigenvalue is supposed to be, uh, yes, so it's supposed to be positive before a quantity, and, and there is actually actually uniformly the eigenvalue for, for, for that large set. Matter of fact, for what you just draw, oh, this, that space one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and then that's one, uh, and we're drawing one. Yes, in the room. Yeah, like I said, um, in one D, uh, the matrix has to be positive. Um, they can't have negative one D. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's true. That's that's very very that problem, yes. Yeah, that's very important for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I actually initially I had that in the slide, but then I removed it because of the space. Um. And so, um. Let's talk about the continuous problem. Let me start. I don't plan to make the proof, but let me start. So this is equation. And what I normally would do, we multiply by W and integrate on time. Uh, on space first and then on time. Okay. So let's multiply by W. And when you multiply by W, you get essentially this. And then you integrate on space. And we have that equation. Okay. So the, let's actually take a look at the first term. The first term is of this form, and this could be written like this. And the derivative, since this is an integral in space, I could put it out, and I get this. Um, then the other term actually has a similar treatment. Is this, and again, I could see it as, as this. Derivative, and then I could actually uh, rewrite this of this one as a divergence. So we have this. Okay, now let's integrate with respect to time. When I integrate with respect to time, I will get because of the of the derivative uh, will cancel out. We will get this quantity minus this on the on the final t and on the initial t plus the integral from zero to time to g of this thing. And the one halves are, are, are gone because it's everywhere. And so this, is you take a look, this is essentially energy. Energy of time t, energy of time zero, and this is another term that we have to start. Um, and so, starting that term um, happens the following. So let's forget for now, this integral, or let's actually focus on this. And I have the Ws, are scalars, and I will apply the divergence. So I need to move the scalars, um, which are at the centers, to the boundary first by with an interpolation, and then apply the divergence. And so I will just copy this oh, later, but uh, let me just, I will need the Q, so, because this will, the discrete analog of this will involve a diagonal matrix Q that I mentioned before. Then I have to talk about the divergence operator and also the interpolation. And so I am showing those here in the dimension. So, this is an interpolation is based on essentially identities. Sometimes we have modification of the identity. It is the identity matrix with a, an extra row of zeros on the top and on the bottom. And there is an identity, an interpolation of first order over here. And 
In addition, we have the weight, the weights are given again for identities, and this is the weight, uh, weight in one dimension. And over here, the dimensional divergence again, it's the they are this kind of matrices with the divergence operator in one D. And so this is a general expression, and the idea is to substitute those into the equation. But let me show you. So this is the equation, and I will introduce a one for convenience. And the W is defined on S, which is the centers and the boundaries. And this type of the, the variance operator, it needs an interpolation to be in N. And so the mimetic approximation of this term is this. I will approximate that integral by this. So it's the data interpolated for the divergence, of, the divergence operator and then the divergence. And the QK is the weights. And when you actually translate this, it's into uh, because all of this has to be converted into a vector in, 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 in memory. And so you apply, um, you convert this and, and, and have this one, which is the one over here. And so the idea, uh, because um, the DS, this um, vectorization, so the W has these components. I just remove or uh, simplify this. And the VEC is the VEC, this operator VEC, which is really the vectorization operator D, D times, where the time dependence has been omitted to simplify the notation. And one is the constant of one discrete scalar field. So the idea is that. Um, and this L, this big L will give me the conversion of a tensor into a vector using the lexicographic order. And if I use properties of, because you see there are a lot of chronicle products inside. If I use this um, with the relationship between the chronicle products and the lexicographic order, plus the fact that the divergence of one, a vector one is zero, and plus the, the one of the properties that I show with respect to the boundary, which is derived from the integration by parts, then I could get this for three dimensions. I have the energy at D was minus the energy at zero, which goes to the other side, and the G information, which is the flux <coughs> from this side. And in 3D, this is the case of 3D, it's given by this quantity. And then you have the energy on the other part, part of the domain. So um, again, this is a long proof and it has a lot of details and I didn't really want to bother you with that. So um, um, I think, and references again is Castillo Brown, Corvino Castillo, Evans, which is uh, a good book for partial differential equations, Lawrence Evans from, um, and then this is the article for for um, the time difference, time difference method, and this is uh, one of the references that I took for for that. Uh, for this equation that mentions actually those properties. I and that's that's it. Was. Questions? Give you a hard one. <laughs> yeah. What do you do when uh, your coefficient matrices have both positive and negative eigenvalues? Why are you going to specify the value? What you just show it only works in the case where you have a single sign value. So waves can only propagate in one direction. For example. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, on 
Um, and uh, the, uh, yes, I, I agree. I am just showing what I will do in that case. Um, actually, it's even more complicated than that because you could have a jump between the new things, and then you have all the effects, um, rarefactions and, and charts. And, yes, I understand. Yeah. But I, I, as I said, I, um, I was focusing on this particular equation for uh, showing um, the, the energy conservation. And ex exactly, I agree. Just to show that the, the purpose was to show, uh, as I said, many, many things, was to show that um, we could consider this case in general. And for that, introduce all the tensors on all the interpolation operators of high order in any dimension. And also the, um, the versions of the, the different operators, the interpolations, um, and how to deal with all these cases, introducing the vector notation, because all this, in the end, you have to go to 1D for doing the computation. And so I just was wondering how to handle all these things. And in a simple case that is relatively generalized, just to show how the operators interact. And there is also a, an induction principle that I use in, in between that I didn't mention. Because uh, at some point, just to show how the boundary condition in, in one of the dimensions shows up, then and, and use this property dimension by dimension. Just to get there. The okay, so did, did I understand correctly that you've got your scalar quantities at the cell centers, let's say that, and at the boundary? Yes. Have that? That's good. Yeah. Because that will make it doable. Okay. Yeah, that's really good. You need that property in order to have a state of suit. Uh, we, we, uh, yeah. Okay. So I'm the code guy. <laughs> the code guy. Uh, we can do uh, any hyperbolic problem. Uh, well, um, there are at least three examples in the library uh, using the mimetic divergence uh, and the and the the big bump, not the tree, but one of the things that ma the, you don't want to mess with the foundation, you don't want to mess with the with the mimetic operators, you want to massage them. And the massage goes through the interpolator. So my point is, uh, with, a, with the right interpolator, the original mimetic divergence, no modifications at all, and uh, a symplectic method, we can go in any direction without use of energy. Right? We, we have at least three examples of that. So, so but because precisely because uh, um, we in the past we, we sent uh, some papers and some people pro finite element. They were very, you know, we were keeping that like very torpedo. Uh, so that's that was my motivation behind those uh, examples. But so the key is that yes, if you don't massage the operator in the case with the in the plate and don't, you don't use the a synthetic method, that will explode. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but the, the important thing I'm thinking of how to do the stability proof in general, mm -hmm. but during the PGC spectral level. Um, and the fact that you have your scalar quantities at the cell centers plus the boundary, yeah, the and then you have your summation by part operator uh, on what on those scalar and vector fields, those then there's a natural way to get boundary conditions that are provably stable um, for any eigenvalue structure. And then you can go to nonlinear problems by changing that to an entropy bound instead of an energy bound. So you've got, I think you've got the pieces that you need. And now you just need to add a couple of terms at the boundaries and uh, you, you can get it to the I don't see the problem with that. But yeah, but the key is that, that the flux of the boundary has to equal to the has to equal to the the interpolant of the flux at the boundary has to equal the flux of the interpolant at the boundary. And then really, you can you can talk to Jeffy Chan and he'll give you special ways of fixing that if you don't have the endpoints. But if you have the endpoints, it's worth it. You're in good shape. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yes. Um, um, in addition, I, I just took for the room one particular model, which is called Greener Castilla. But uh, we, we, we have um, um, information everywhere, like a fully stacked. Mm -hmm. All these interpolation go away. I don't have to. Yeah, the only thing that's important is the summation by far. So as long as you've got that and you've got the values of your scalar fields on the boundary, then you're good to go. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> you anticipate developing a library with fully staggered grids? Yeah, we are in the process. Yeah. It's not a it won't be a big deal. Actually, the band will increase a little bit of the storage metrics, but it will be faster because and more more accurate because you don't have to interpolate. Another question. Any question from the virtual world? Hi, I have a question. Can you can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yeah. uh, Dr. Dumet, this is Anand here. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I have a quick question on your, so you talk about the uh, temporal scheme, the time integration scheme being a leapfrog, fifth order leapfrog. It, and I it, think I heard you mention that this is a, an implicit scheme. So I was wondering, and I think uh, Johnny probably mentioned that uh, we do have symplectic schemes that are uh, explicit. I was wondering if you can comment on uh, if we have to go with uh, staggered in time and staggered in space, do we eventually resort, do we have to resort to an implicit time integration scheme or do you think we can still achieve energy conservation using an explicit scheme like a symplectic scheme? Yes, if you are considering um, these uh, staggered grids, then normally in the space you will have some quantities on on the nodes and some other quantities on the faces, sorry, on the on the centers. And so it is implicit. Uh, well, I mentioned it's implicit because this quantity is also here. And however, when you actually um, Right, this way, it's it's an implicit that is solved very easily, and and actually the, my implementation for this particular algorithm, uh, for this, for the next particular problem, is with an staggered grid in time, um, because all of these indices suggest that. Yeah, but the the issue about implicit versus explicit is. Uh... For a huge problem, we don't want to have to solve a system of equations. This algorithm doesn't solve any system of equations. Well, that's the that's the answer to Anna. Yeah. So it is actually the way it looks is looking implicit, but in the implementation is explicit. It's completely implicit. I see. Okay. So you're just using the previous values of uh, sidebar to calculate. Exactly. So it depends on these four quantities. Once you generate, yeah. just run an explicit. Let, yeah, let me make another comment related with Anna's uh, question. It turned out that if we have to solve a problem which has a Hamiltonian structure, then you cannot be symplectic schemes in time. And we have those. Uh, but we are looking for a schemes to solve problems which don't which don't have a Hamiltonian structure. And so far, the only one that and conserve energy. The only one that exists, to my knowledge, is the relaxation room Gakuta, which is very expensive. So that's this is an exploration in getting that and look like we found one. Any other questions? That no, we're going to thank our speaker one more time.